Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, telemedicine in rheumatology. We are privileged enough to have a uh, really expert in with us tonight, uh, Dr. Philip Bosch, who is uh, at the Department of Rheumatology and Immunology at the Medical Univ University of Graz in Austria. So, uh, good Abend. <laughs> Philip, and uh, yeah. <laughs> we are very excited to hear what you have to tell us. And I, I understand that this is going to be, you have a presentation, but it's very much going to be a conversation, right, between the audience and you. Yes, exactly. So I want to start with giving like an introduction on what, what sort of research uh, we performed in the past to give you an overview of the points to consider of remote care. And afterwards, I'm really keen on, on hearing about your thoughts on this and have a good discussion. So I will share my screen with you. And please just give me an OK if you see my slides. Yes, we see your slides. OK. Well, first of all, let me say it's a huge privilege uh, also to be here uh, talking to you today and uh, giving you some uh, information on uh, telemedicine and studies that have been performed in the recent years on this topic. And I think it's it's an important topic and whether you like it or not, uh, it's something that's uh, coming one way or, or the other. And I think it's important that we, you, the physicians and everyone involved uh, leads the way uh, to, to make this something suitable and something positive. Uh, for patient care. So I have some disclosures, uh, generally speaking, but for today I have uh, no conflict of interest. And telemedicine. So telemedicine is a word <laughs> and there is a definition for telehealth and it is the use of telecommunications and virtual technology to deliver healthcare outside of traditional healthcare facilities. And when hearing this, you might already suspect where this is sort of coming from or what gave it the big kickstart in the last years. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic obviously uh, was something completely different for patient care. And uh, there was even a study made here from 2020 or 2021, where they asked physicians, uh, rheumatologists on their thoughts of on patient care during this time and the answers were physicians uh, thought that diagnosis were delayed they thought the treatment was delayed patients did not get adequate uh, treatment at different times so it's a huge issue and of course in situations like this there needs to be an alternative and this was of course uh, what what gave remote care or telehealth like the kickstart. So um, one year ago, uh, I was in a project that's called EULA points to consider for remote care in rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. Uh, I worked together with Annette de Tura, Christian de Jaco and Andrea Markisch. And we were like the very core team. And then there were a lot of other people um, and also someone from uh, Lupus Europe, uh, Sarah Badre, who was involved in this project to formulate some points to consider when doing um, remote care or telehealth. Telemedicine, of course, and I'm sure we'll hear about it in the discussions later on, is not just something that everyone's uh, super excited about. Uh, so there's also this mixed method study that I found uh, recently published in 2020. Uh, 2022, and it asked patients and physicians about their experiences with telemedicine. And I have just four quick statements that I'd like, like to read out because uh, they are written out in this um, publication. The first one from a lupus patient. It's nice that my GP has called me. This way, I didn't have to go to her practice. She has also called me to check if I'm having flares. Small things like this really kept me going during lockdown. Another patient with lupus, all the time he was interrupting and my words were falling on deaf ears. 
how's your skin? Me starting to flare. Again, no advice or reaction. I felt like I was on a very long patient list. He had to get through and he was taking no and he was taking no prisoners. I decided I didn't want to see him again and was greatly upset by his abruptness and attitude. Then something from a uh, patient with systemic sclerosis. I like them, honestly. I feel more listened to and less dismissed. Maybe it's changed how I present myself too, as I'm more confident in my own space and not so aware of being judged visually. And last, a clinician. It's harder for them to remember the patients. They're thinking about what's going on in the background with their house. They don't actually, uh, they don't actually then think so much and focus than if they were sitting in your office and there were no distractions, and they are not then as mentally prepared. So we see a lot of different ways and different experiences that people uh, have had with this issue, and um, good ones and bad ones. So. For the, um, the points to consider, there are different parts in a patient's journey where telehealth could be of use. And I will show you where, where we said it can be of use, um, talking about prioritization of an appointment from to pre-diagnostics, diagnosis, uh, to drug education, uh, modification of doses, monitoring the need for a face-to-face -face consult, and of course also therapy through physiotherapy and herbal therapy delivered online. But as you may know, it does not always look exactly like this. It can get uh, complicated pretty quickly. And when something gets difficult, or let's say you have a flare, then you might not be so happy to just have someone on the phone or doing a teleconference, because it is a different uh, thing when having a person right, right next to you. There's no discussion on that. So these points to consider, uh, this is just to show you how, how these um, points to consider are usually done. We have one virtual meeting that was in 2020. Then you do a systematic literature review. You look at all the literature there is. Uh, me and my colleague, Andrea Markesh, we had to do this. And then you present all this information at a second meeting and formulate the points to consider. And the objective was to identify the best evidence available for development, prioritization, and implementation of telehealth or remote care. We used it synonymously for patients with rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases. So there are four overarching principles and nine um, points to consider that I'd like to show you quick and also give some, some extras into this. Uh, so the first overarching principle is tailored care combining remote and face-to-face -face attendance should be based on shared decision-making as well as the needs and preferences of people with rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases. So shared decision-making. As um, the LOA um, in the end stands for level of agreement and in this group of people that discuss on these formulations, uh, there needs to be agreements. And if you have an agreement of 10, that's everyone agrees. If you would have an agreement of, I don't think you can get to zero or one, but that would mean you have no agreement at all. And the number in the parenthesis is just a measure of dispersion, how the answers were given. So we're talking about shared decision-making when we decide to have a, um, a telehealth visit. Then remote care for people with RMDs can be delivered by all members of the healthcare team using a variety of healthcare techniques. So this was to also include not only physicians, but also physio, ergotherapists, nurses, and anyone who's involved in the healthcare uh, team. Telehealth intervention Interventions should be developed in collaboration with all stakeholders, including the healthcare team, caregivers, and people with RMDs. I think this also makes a lot of sense. If you want to create something new that has to do with telehealth and you want to use it uh, in clinical practice, then the people that it affects the most should be included in this. 
then members of the healthcare team involved in remote care interventions, interventions should have adequate equipment and training as well as telecommunication skills. Wow, I hope everyone has great te telecommunication skills. Um, having the adequate equipment and training, I think, is a very individual thing because the training and the equipment depends on the healthcare provider and the options you have from a simple telephone call uh, to a Zoom meeting or to another platform that's special for your hospital. So these were overarching principles. And now we come to the points to consider. Um, so what one can consider to do. And the first one is the pre-assessment by telehealth may be considered to improve the referral process to rheumatology and health prioritization of people with suspected RMDs. You see the level of agreement is already slightly, slightly uh, declining, still very high. And then there's also this LOE, with, which means level of evidence. And there's also a scale for this, just showing that when you have a level of evidence of one, you have great randomized controlled trials uh, that have, have asked this question and they give um, an answer to the statements. Going further down the line, the quality of studies goes down. So 2B, I think if I remember correctly, we had a lot of cohort studies of good quality uh, that would give us some uh, background and some power to give to make this statement. And I'll give you an example on the next slide uh, where I will show you the second point to consider, which is telehealth may assist the pre-diagnostic process for patients with rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases. However, the diagnosis should be established in a face-to-face -face meeting. So there were actually two studies here, uh, both very similar, uh, where they had 100 patients in one of them. Uh, being at a general physician, and they were there to assess a potential rheumatic musculoskeletal disease. And the, the GP would take the history and do a first status, and then call by phone a rheumatologist and speak to the rheumatologist with the patient um, also in the room, so all the three of them could talk. And after this conversation, the rheumatologist would write down a di diagnosis. After that, they would switch on a camera and make it a teleconference. So the patient would see the physician, the, the rheumatologist, and vice versa. And again, after, after some minutes of talking, the rheumatologist would again write down the diagnosis he had. After that, the patient would come to the, uh, face, uh, to the, to the clinics and they would actually see each other. And this is when the gold standard, the real diagnosis was made. And it was interesting to see that actually after the phone call, um, the rheumatologists had an accuracy of around 70% for the correct diagnosis. And after switching on the camera, it went up to 97%. One has to say, however, that these were patients uh, mostly with non-inflammatory rheumatic diseases, such as uh, osteoarthritis or musculoskeletal pain. But there were also a couple of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis in there. No patients with lupus, though. Uh, and the second study is very similar. And from it was again um, with GP, and they had a, tele, a teleconference with the rheumatologist. And when the patient came to the clinics, they made the diagnosis and they found that um, from the 38 patients that were assessed, um, after the teleconference, the rheumatologist would say that 23 of them had an inflammatory arthritis. In the end, only 15 had an inflammatory arthritis, but uh, none of the patients that after the, the teleconference were considered to have no inflammatory rheumatic disease, they also did not have a diagnosis of inflammatory disease afterwards. So this was like if you could call it a sensitive substitute uh, that was not so specific. Another point to consider was the decision to initiate disease-modifying drugs should be made in a face-to-face -face visit. Telehealth may be used for drug education, monitoring, and facilitating adherence. 
So I'm also so giving you um, a study here. It's a randomized controlled trial with 92 patients with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which were randomized to receive standard care after they were prescribed a drug. And then um, the second group would receive four telephone calls over the duration of, I think, 12 or 24 weeks. And on the, in these calls, the patients would be um, uh, advised to, th they would re-educate them on rheumatoid arthritis, on treatment goals, on the importance of taking medicine, side effects of management, and also how to use a reminder for uh, medication intake. And what they found was that after these 12 to 24 weeks, um, patients that received these phone calls, they actually also adhered better to medication adherence, uh, meaning that they were more likely to actually take um, the, the drugs prescribed. However, there was no real difference in disease activity after that time. So uh, kind of a curious finding. Finally, uh, a point to consider where I found a lupus study. Um, those modifications or suspension of disease-modifying drugs, as well as addition of analgesics, NSAIDs, so uh, non-steroidal rheumatic uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, such as ibuprofen, for example, or glucocorticoids, can be discussed with people with RMDs using telehealth. And here, it might not be the best example of studies, but it was a study with lupus patients, so I, I tried to take it. Uh, this was a study, also a randomized control trial, where they, there were 50 patients with lupus, and um, one group was usual care, and the other group was usual care, but they would also have a 16-week digital therapeutic intervention. And what this means was that they had an app where they, in, where they put in information on the dietary information, lifestyle, potential triggers for symptoms, and then they would be contacted by uh, a member of the healthcare team uh, speaking about this, uh, giving advice for also pain medication, dietary changes, and lifestyle changes. And this study showed that after 16 weeks, actually after getting uh, this feedback, there were better results for um, different outcomes, including fatigue, uh, health-related quality of life, and pain compared to the treatment as usual group. Number five, telehealth can be used to monitor symptoms, disease activity, and other outcomes. And here we might have the best study uh, of the whole uh, literature review that we did. This is a Danish um, a randomized control trial with 419 patients with rheumatoid arthritis and have received a standard face-to-face -face, uh, visit, a normal care after every three to four months. And the other group received telephone consultations with a trained nurse or rheumatologist, and they assessed which patients, uh, which symptoms the patients had and whether there was the need for a face-to-face -face meeting. And after 52 weeks, the, um, the outcome measure in rheumatoid arthritis, it's called DAS28, uh, was similar between both groups. So both groups were in a similar state of activity or let's say non-activity, but the number of visits was um, lower in the, in the telehealth group, about 1.75 visits per year compared to the face-to-face -face group where the, the mean number of visits was around uh, 4.2 per year. So showing that, uh, and, and furthermore, that the patients that were contacted by a nurse or by a rheumatologist would also have the same disease activity or the same uh, outcomes of disease after this time. So it made no difference. Number six, we're getting there. Telehealth may be used to discuss the need for face-to-face -face consultation or other interventions. I, sort of the, the last study I talked about already had, um, had some saying in this, 
in, in this point to consider talking about uh, these face-to-face -face visits. In this one, uh, we had a randomized controlled trial also with uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis uh, over six months. The patients were in active disease and received um, a basic a thera a therapy, the edema therapy, so like methotrexate, for example, and were then randomized to either standard care or care using uh, with the addition of an app. And this app would ask the patient in regular um, intervals certain questions according to a so-called rapid pre-score, uh, which gives some insight on whether a patient has a flare or not, or whether how active he or she is or not. And if the score went over 12, then a rheumatologist would be, um, it, they, they would pop up in, um, virtually for a rheumatologist. The rheumatologist would call the patient and find out whether there was the necessity for a visit. And what this study showed was that again, after the six month clinical function status status was similar between uh, the intervention and the control group. But again, the number of visits uh, sharply declined. Number seven, telehealth should be considered for non-pharmacological interventions, including but not limited to disease education, advice on physical exercise, self-management strategies, and psychological treatment. And here we found an overwhelming amount of studies, actually, mostly on uh, physical exercise, on physiotherapy, uh, where it showed that it is actually an effective substitute for face-to-face -face physiotherapy. Uh, me having um, a, a wife who is a physiotherapist, I actually had the feeling that this can't be correct because I think having someone... Uh, showing the exercises also with the hands makes a difference, but there's an amazing amount of literature that proves me otherwise, showing that also doing this by uh, Zoom uh, has, has health benefits. And the last two, then you made it through all the points to consider. Uh, barriers to remote care should be evaluated and resolved wherever possible. Of course, what are barriers? Barriers could be of problems with insurance companies, lack of knowledge uh, about how to use your telecommunication, um, lack of safety because you don't know what, what happens with the, the call, uh, the miss, that you miss a face-to-face -face contact, that you don't have that, but you wish to have one again, and you fear that you won't get it because now you are always in telehealth. That can also all be barriers. And uh, and then, of course, the last uh, point to consider was that people with RMDs using remote care should be offered training in using telehealth. And this is really hard because who is going to deliver the training? Who's going to pay for the training? And is this something that should be done on a global level or on the very, very uh, unit? And I think it's nearly impossible to do it on a global level, probably because each, um, each hospital is different. Everyone works differently. We, we tried to give it at least a very small global <laughs> something. Um, back then, Sarah and I, and also in a, in a, in a meeting at, at the PARA um, meeting in Brussels, we came up with a small infographic, which is currently being developed on some very basic steps that you can uh, think about when, before doing um, a virtual consultation. Uh, this is, of course, just very basically uh, something that you can have a first look at, and then you need to go into detail. Uh, but at least we try to give uh, yeah, something from us into this. So it's a start. Yeah, and so this has been my presentation on all these points to consider. And wow, you made it through. Congratulations. <laughs> and now I'm really keen on, on discussing with you because I have pen and paper ready. And as I said before, I also see this a bit uh, as, a, as a focus group for me because we're going to update these um, points to consider. And I hope that you can give feedback. 
um, also to me and to see what, what you think about it, what you think should be done differently. Yeah, I'm just curious about it. And first, I think we have some icebreaker questions. Going on, ah, there they are. Fantastic. So have you, have, have you already had a teleconsultation? If you had one, how was your experience? And then it's something about who to, uh, who who to be happy to talk to while doing a teleconsultation. So I I'm, I hope you all see this because it, on my screen it says that zero out of three have responded. So I'm not sure if everyone got it. No, no, answers are coming in. Uh, answers are coming in. Okay. <laughs> Not zero. I just sent the answer. I'm sorry. The answers are coming in. Yeah, I think everyone has answered. Um... Yeah. No. There's some more people. It's a bit like at the. Uh... Eurovision uh, song contest now. Everyone will have answered once, yeah, once you reach the 19, which is the number of people less the, the host and co-hosts. We need to remove Philip as well. So 18 answers will be everyone. But so we're missing only two, so it's okay. <clears throat> and you probably can close it. Ah, there it is. Ah, so the majority had a teleconsultation and the results were so-so. <laughs> and if your disease is under control and you had a teleconsultation, would you be okay talking to a trained nurse instead of a rheumatologist is a 50-50. So very interesting, very interesting indeed. So I think we're open up for the discussion. Uh, what do you think about these, these points to consider that I've presented? Let's make it very open. So I, I can begin. <laughs> um, I've heard from a lot of uh, HCPs that uh, they don't like to use teleconsultations. Uh, how do we solve that? <laughs> if the doctors don't like to use it and the patients do, uh, do you hear that as well? That uh, doctors are sort of hesitant to use it? I think there are a lot of um, doctors that are hesitant to use it. Uh, we are currently in our outpatient department working on digitalizing everything. And also this is a huge step. And I think everything takes time and you need a good program and you need someone who's also updating it and making it more feasible. Otherwise, everyone's just worried about it. Violetta, you have a question? Uh, if I may, I don't think it's about that they don't like to uh, make these uh, consultations. I think it's about that sometimes they, they don't know the patient. It's completely different when you've got a relation with your doctor and the doctor knows you and uh, you know your doctor and you can just freely speak online or wherever, just even send a message because you do trust each other and completely different when you will be referred to a new doctor and he or she, they don't know you just. So this is the barrier uh, that we cannot just come through, I think. Do you usually in your outpatient department always see the same physician when you go there or is it always someone different? It depends, because uh, uh, when you've got a GP, as in Poland, usually you have the same doctor. It's just uh, we are uh, with chronic uh, disease, with chronic illness, since we've been uh, referred uh, to a specialist, we do not go back to GP. We always go to specialists. And also 
each country is different because you've got the private section and uh, the, the section that is from your insurance. And sometimes when you have to use uh, a visit uh, with a doctor uh, privately and you're going to the new one, you don't know each other and you do not trust each other. And it's on, at some point, I would say it's good because when doctor don't know you, means that uh, he's not really, sometimes you might even use the doctor to uh, subscribe to your, your some uh, painkillers, right? I, I was going to uh, agree with you, but not for the painkillers. I think it's sometimes great to see uh, a different rheumatologist because mm -hmm. when I see a new patient, I start from the very beginning again. And sometimes this is very helpful um, for, for yeah. some things that maybe were overlooked at some point or to go into detail on things. It also depends from the doctor because sometimes uh, you've got a diagnosis you will go to different specialists because uh, your uh, doctor will have no time or no uh, just timeline to, uh, for appointment. And he will say like, what do you want? You've got diagnosis. Why did you come here? Really? So uh, it depends. Thank you, Violetta. Amy, you have a question? Hi, yeah, sorry. If my camera is not talking to your uh, check your communications element and defying it for me. <laughs> um, I'm just just a comment really on what you just said about starting from the beginning, because I actually had my rheumatologist consultation today, sort of my checkup that I haven't had in a while. And it was due to the rotation of staff, because my previous rheumatologist had gone back to Ireland because I'm in the UK. Um, I saw a new doctor and actually she was great because she was very informed on my history, but she also did bring up a couple of new things that I hadn't thought of in sort of the um, stag, because I suffer a lot from heartburn for my, uh, with my lupus and my, my immunosuppressants, and it was sort of staggering my metrazole or upping the dose and very simple things about the timing of things and the timing of eating, but things that I hadn't actually put much emphasis on. And it was quite refreshing because, I mean, I've had it since for 11 years. And it's those small things that you can overlook sometimes, but the quality of life of not getting the heartburn as frequently would be great. Definitely. Yeah. So sometimes it could be good as long as it's not every time. So you need to explain your entire disease history again. Well, I didn't, I, that's what I was relieved about. I didn't have to do that because I've had that before with yeah. registrars and you just like, did you not read my notes? This is frustrating as hell. You know, like, whereas it was a more of a, you know, stuff about me, but let's ask a few kind of questions. You know what I mean? It wasn't like starting from scratch because yes, that is very frustrating. And have you ever had uh, a teleconsultation, Amy? Uh, yes, I have. I've had quite a few actually. Um, I, over COVID, uh, my, um, I kind of between rheumatology and nephrology, sort of multidisciplinary team, but one of them kind of takes the lead. So over COVID, it was the rheum uh, the nephrology team, sorry. So I got a call from um, my doctor. She did offer a video call, but I was fine with the phone call. Um, I have had, we actually have a, I'm quite fortunate that we have a nurse helpline at my hospital. So with regard to the last question, I've had really good advice from nurse specialists. So it makes me more inclined to say yes, because I know it's going to be high quality information and more readily available. You know, like I can get an answer within kind of usually about 24 hours, 48 at the most, which is good. If I have a question, I can just ring, leave a message and they call back. But I know that every hospital doesn't have that or every country doesn't have that, unfortunately. Yeah. We have a few comments in the chat. Uh, so Metsy says that her doctor only uses telemedicine to give her results of research. Um, and Marie says, going to university hospital, I usually see a doctor in training. The professor is supervising the department. The trainee does the teleconsultation. Sometimes it's better to have the one calling you know or have seen you before, have seen before. So that's another way of doing it. Thank you for those comments. That's not always easy in a university hospital to, to really get the right position for the right patient. I, I know this very well. Yeah. yeah. 
and still train the doctors as you need to. Yeah. Juan. Hi, I was in my country. There is not many people, and there is a very long, uh, far, uh, like um, there are very far to travel to see a doctor if you live in a rural rural area. And tell it, like yeah, so like telephone conversation with doctors are used a lot and sometimes like like facebook like like uh, this uh, yeah zoom calls or something like that and i think it's very important and i think that if people get used to it it was almost almost the same especially if it is a it's a zoom, zoom call or or teams or something because some people in rural, rural area are not able to go to doctors if they don't have this and they could not see specialists in their field if, if unless paying a lot of money for it to travel by plane or something so so i think it's worked very well and but i think people have to get like learn to use it be prepared and ask the right, be prepared, prepared, prepared to questions and you have to think things differently than if you go to a normal doctor conference. Thanks. And yeah, and I, I completely agree that especially as you say, in, if you live in a rural area and let's say everything's sort of fine, then you you're you could you could actually like to just have a phone call with your physician every now and then or with your rheumatologist. I think this is maybe one of the key groups for for whom telehealth is is a really good idea. Yeah, but as Amy also says in the chat, I think it has to be a balance as there are certain physical elements that need to be face to face, such as checking joints, skin, swelling in legs, etc. Also, when bloods and urine samples are required, maybe a face-to-face -face at a de designated interval in treatment. So having once in a while those face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and Elivina says, during COVID, doctors didn't have any experience in the beginning, and it was a problem. Yeah, the doctors are more trained now. Also, it limits blood tests. Yeah, again, whenever you need some samples of blood or skin or anything else, then you, of course, still need to go into clinic. But it's good to have these, this alternative when things are looking okay. Andri? You are muted, Andri? Uh, yeah. uh, I think that uh, when you have a face, face meeting with your doctor, you feel more safe. You feel you have the time uh, to mention uh, things, maybe very uh, little things for your situation, but very important. When you have a telecommunication with your doctor, what you do, you just listen what your doctor said, the advices of the doctor, and uh, say only very little things about what you want to mention. And after you use the telephone, you think I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And this—that's why you feel you don't have um, uh, um, what uh, in the, the doctor, the meeting with the doctor. You have to do your consultation, and you, you will see that your doctor for two or three, four me, uh, months. Uh, I think uh, you feel that when you have this telecommunication with the doctor. Just to mention little things, not to have your consultation day. Did you ever have, like, I've heard this from patients before saying that they forgot about asking so many questions, but also in a face-to-face -face meeting. Do you think this is something 
typical that gets worse when on a, being on the telephone, or is this something also a general problem? You feel not to give to that idea that you feel that you have to be very um take very short time for the doctor because when you do this when you treat doctor it just mentioned one or two things that happens in the day or in a week you have uh, to see what to do or the, the consultation of getting but uh, what we discuss now is just to have your meetings your face to face meetings to uh, to replace it with this tele um, communication with the doctor, I think is uh, we have to train ourselves to be an attitude. Maybe the doctors are willing, maybe this will work, but as patients, and uh, we said as patients in Cyprus, of course, because I don't know what other uh, countries um, uh, used to do and how long they use this. And that's what I feel that I'm not safe, that I didn't have um, um, complete communication with my Maybe because we use this um, after from the COVID and, and uh, since then. On, only this period is a very short period for us in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. I sort of think I know what you mean, Andrea, that it's when you're not going somewhere to see the doctor physically, it's such a short time in your day that you actually talk with the person. So you forget what you wanted yes. to say and just, you have yes. other things going on right before and right after. Sometimes you don't decide when the call is. The doctor is calling you when, when he has the time. Yeah. yeah. So it might be a bit confused. And then and, it's, and and when you are face to face with the doctor, I have I think this communication that you have with the doctor, uh, you are blocked, and you can um, say things that maybe is is not in your mind to to mention them before, and hmm. because of this focus we have in our mind, sometimes in the telephone, this focus is bigger. <laughs> hmm. But in any case, as Mitty also writes, we have to prepare before our appointment, whether it's face-to-face -face or by phone. So it's important that patients prepare and make have a question ready before they go into the consultation. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Violetta. Well, I would like to thank Andrea what she mentioned about this uh, preparation before for uh, the visit and doesn't matter if this is online visit or just face-to-face -face visit we uh just uh, we tell our patients in our uh, society that they should uh, just write it down just before the visit what they want to speak about and also i think uh, what would be helpful would be uh the uh base of your medic medical history the, like um electronic base of your medical history that you can decide if you want uh, which doctor you want to uh, share with, for example. And not only the space supposed to be in our country because we do travel a lot. It would be brilliant to have this European base that you can just share. Because sometimes you go for uh, holidays or whatever, something will happen. You might not so remember everything, what medication you take. You will forget uh, to say something to your doctor. And then you will click one button and your doctor can see everything. Would, wouldn't it be this wonderful? That, that sounds so sweet. <laughs> that would make my, my life so much easier <laughs> as well. Instead of... Yeah, so uh, the patient coming with a pile of documents and you need to check everything, right? You know, data safety and it's it's not easy getting these things done. Uh, in, in, at least in, in Austria, it's already horrible getting all your documents from one hospital to the other and mm -hmm. you need to sign 20 waivers and then still half of it isn't on the platform. It's supposed to be. not sure, at least in Austria, it's not going. Wow. Yes, okay. every hospital has got a different platform, but uh, it's possible to build a, do one platform for everyone. It yeah. is possible. Yes. And uh, this is our future because we do go through digital everything, 
and uh, it's seriously like um, also uh, as I said before uh, travel to a doctor is uh, quite more difficult than uh, just uh, seeing a doctor face to face online uh, this is the future and we need to adjust this is scary we are really frightened about our date and uh, things uh, it's just uh, this will help everyone yeah. I can tell I'm from a country where it already ex exists, so <laughs> it is possible. It but is. we're also quite a small country, so. <laughs> yeah, we have a few. Um, so Amy has a question to you, actually, uh, Philip. Are you looking into remote testing as a part of the telemedicine study? Remote so, testing. So I'm think, I think she's talking about blood samples and tissue samples, yes, things so like that. So... Yeah, that kind of thing. In regard to either through the post or a sort of remote service where they come to you for rural areas, you know, like a nurse van, not a van, but you know what I mean, like a, a professional version of a van and a nurse. <laughs> so sort of like someone comes to you, takes a blood sample and maybe also does a clinical exam. Was this something? Maybe that not, you... not really the clinical exam. I think that would still be. Uh, you know, like if you had a video call, it would be you could still do that and show them online because you're still trying to negate that part, aren't you? You don't want to take the doctor out there. But I mean, more like I guess in the UK, you have like mammogram service where they'll go to areas that are under under deprived or under representative represented, and then they have a screening service there. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be like the patient's home if it was the van type thing, but it could be to a more remote area or they do certain testing through the post now. You know, you can send samples that will test for bowel cancer and samples that will test for your antiviral levels and things like that. So I don't know the practical implications for lupus, but I'm just wondering if that's the sort of direction that you might be going in. Uh, I think this is something that's already happening, as you, as you said. Um, I know that we, we have the options to send blood samples and different tissue samples uh, from different places, um, ma mainly blood samples, to be honest, um, from, from one place to the other. Of course, um, other tissue, I was thinking about maybe, uh, yeah, no, I'm not sure which, which tissue would really uh, benefit in this case. I think this is something that's that's already being done and this is going to get bigger. And I agree that there will be more like a, a mobile version of, of testing in, in the future for remote areas. I think that's going to happen. I don't even think we will need much studies about this. Okay. Yeah, because I'm just curious if it sort of went in in sort of parallel with your study because it's about removing the burden of you know, going into a physical institution. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think we found any studies on this topic. It's interesting. Um, we'll, we'll discuss about it the next time. It's a good point. But I don't think any studies on this. Okay. Thank you for your time. <laughs> you now have a new research project. <laughs> that's, that's what happens when you talk to people from Louis Europe. <laughs> I'm like, can you send everything to me? That'd be great. <laughs> You have a comment or a question. Yes, um, I, I want to say that we have an Iceland a platform like Violet was talking about that, like, is that like really a web page and you go into it and you can see everything concerning your health and doctor's appointment and through this platform you can contact your doctors, either specialists or a GP, and 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 th this is connected, and all the doctors are connected through the same platform, like it's called Saga, and and in there there is everything about, and and if you go to a maybe one specialist, he writes maybe his notes about you, and then you go to another specialist. And and he can see everything that was great, and also the TP, and and it can be really good because when you go to a doctor, they can see everything and can be really prepared. 
but you can never have a private conversation to the do your doctor because they see everything. And if you were talking to your doctor about something that maybe was embarrassing or you were complaining about another doctor or like talking about something you didn't want the other doc your other doctors to know, maybe if they are like for young people, if they had maybe young girl wanted to start the pill or something, everybody sees it. And like I told my GP that I was going to a vacation and then I went to my specialist at the hospital and she said, oh, how is the planning for the trip to Paris? And, and yeah, so it is a very good system, but, but I, like, I don't know if it is like, yeah, so it can be very handy, but I, but I have, uh, I'm not sure, sure if this might be the best, but through this system, you can contact your doctor. If you like have a telecommunication with a doctor, you can just, and you forget something, you can just send them like a small note through the system and they will have it and they will answer you on the same day. And even in the, in the night, the doctor is a very good doctor. So, yeah, but so this, I think it's a very good system that pilot suggested, but in practice, it is uh, raise some questions with me at least. Yeah, and I think what Violetta also said before, I think it's important that you decide uh, which doctor gets uh, which information. Uh, so I think that's important. Yeah, we have, don't have that freedom in this system. Mm -hmm. yeah, usually there should be a function that says this is not to be shared and then you can decide not to share it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the patient doesn't see the system that the doctors, it's the saga system. And so okay. you can see what the doctor writes about you. Mm. So. Yeah. yeah, there are pros and cons for yeah. everything. So we have a comment from Anne-Marie that during the pandemic, once in a while, she visited a physical therapist who showed her oh, the exercises. Oh, Sorry. Um, and then they have an app showing the exercises and then it can see if you do your exercises as indicated and then they can change the exercises if, if, if needed. So that's also kind of telehealth, right? Because you, uh, they can follow you. You make sure you do your exercises the right way and you feel like you are guided all the way through. Yeah, I, and as I, as I said before, there's also a lot of studies on physiotherapy. So apparently you can really do a lot uh, via Zoom. I mean, I also took a, an online class during COVID. <laughs> A training so it, it, it works and if you have someone who monitors what you're doing and they see it and they can give you advice i think that's a very feasible option especially yeah. if you can't move from the place you are definitely yeah. we also had have exercise uh, videos in the pishura that people can use from home so it's a good way of getting people to move if they have no other option there's a lot of interesting things going on in a comment that uh, Delilah made. Does anyone here have access to their test results online? Some kind of platform where you can see your results and we have a lot of answers. <laughs> so maybe, um, Henri, you said, yes, you have an app. Could you explain a bit about that? How does, how does that work? I got a lot of apps. I got one for my hospital, one for my GP and one for my pharmacist. And uh, with the hospital, I can make appointments. I uh, get an, a message when I have appointments. I can check in when I'm in the hospital. I get a message when there are new lab results. I can look into it. And sometimes you don't want to look into your test results. But, um, <laughs> and with the Pharmacist is when I see that my medicine uh, are uh, getting, I have, don't have any, um, how do you call it? Prescriptions. I know if I'm, my medicines in my box are getting 
Oh, expiring. Yeah, and uh, no, not expiring. That I don't know. No. Fill zero no. box for no. the next week or for for the next two weeks, and I order it with my pharmacist, and they will, will bring it to my home. And if it's not, uh, they don't have prescription. I I have an app for my GP, and I can send a message, and he will send the prescription to the pharmacist, and they will bring it to me, so I can stay at home if I want to. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. if you're if you're not feeling well. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, and um, yeah, and I like it for those kind of things. But as I said before, I like to visit my uh, doctors once in a while, uh, like because they have to check more for me. If my skin is the problem, so they have to see it online. It's difficult to see what's going on. Yeah. You better can see it in real life. So uh, that's my reason why I want to see the doctor. But yeah, once a year, one, two week times a year, not, and when it's necessary. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We have a really great discussion going on. <laughs> so, um, any closing remarks from your end, Philip? I, I actually wanted to have one last question. Could I ask one more question? Take Definitely. <laughs> let, let's see. Hopefully it's not getting uh, too long. Um, I'm curious uh, whether you think that if you're not going to, to, the, to your rheumatologist, how well do you think you can assess your own state of disease activity without a physician or compare it to the physician? What, what your thoughts are on this? what I'm curious about. I think it's a good question. Uh, uh, when you were uh, talking about lupus only, not all rheumatology, you might not be able uh, to go further uh, along without your physician because you do need to uh, do the tests. You, uh, your uh, kidneys, they don't hurt. You don't know if there are any changes. You need to uh, do the checkup every now and then. Besides uh, lupus, other like uh, unclosing spondylitis or array, it's possible that you can uh, go through your own for some time, knowing your symptoms and lower your pain as possible. I think it very much depends on uh, your disease, as you say, and also how long you've had the disease. So if you know your own body, if you know your own or your own symptoms and know what to look for, if you feel like something is coming on and you've had the experience before, you might know now it's time to go see my rheumatologist in person. Of course, when you use your medication that has been prescribed, mm. uh, not uh, going uh, instead of medication, just uh, towards some supplements uh, that will not work alone. <laughs> they do help. <laughs> they will not. <laughs> they will not cure you. No. <laughs> Absolutely. Gwen, you have a comment as well. Yes, I think that, like in the beginning, it's important to to meet the doctor in person, for at least from time to time. But but it is okay to have consult through phone phone call or. Or computer, but but you should but you should anyway have to take the blood test or, or urine test. Like I think you can't like you can't monitor your disease if you don't go to have the test because sometimes you don't feel if things are getting worse. So I think it's very important to take the test. Like uh, yeah, so but you can have the like telephone conversation with the doctor and just see the doctor if it is like if the blood tests are bad or something like that. But you have to take the test. Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for for your thoughts on this. I was really curious and and knowing what your opinion on on this question was. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you so much. I I know we got a lot of, out of it. I hope you did too, Philip. <laughs> and there's still some information in the in the chat you can uh, look at afterwards. Um, 
thank you so much for a really interesting presentation and discussion. I think it was really helpful for all of us. Um, we have, for you guys on Zoom, we have a brief evaluation at the end. So keep hanging on and you'll get some questions. For the people on Facebook, I would like to say thank you very much for listening in. Uh, have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>